Hey you guys, it's Brittany and welcome back. Happy holidays, happy new year. We are here in 2022 and I wanted to kick off this new year with a story that has a better ending than most other cases that we cover here. And that is the case of Ahmad Arbery. Now, if you are not familiar with this case, this is the definition of running while black. So if you want to hear all about this unfortunate case and the more hopeful outcome, stay tuned. Now, as another year kicks off on my channel, I always still want to give thanks to everyone who has stuck around, everyone who has subscribed, everyone who has followed me on Instagram, all of that, all of the support, I truly do appreciate. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For those of you who are just finding my channel, please make sure that you subscribe. Make sure that you get involved in those comments down below. Make sure you hit that like button as well. And I appreciate it in advance. Now let's get right into this story. As I mentioned in the beginning of this video, this is the case of Ahmad Arbery. Now Ahmad at the time was a 25 year old black man who enjoyed his fitness, enjoyed his running, and he was caught running in a non-black neighborhood while being black. And unfortunately, his life was taken mostly because of that reason. So let's get into some background on Ahmad Arbery first. Now, Ahmad Arbery was born and raised in Brunswick, Georgia. He was said to have a huge heart. He was said to have a wonderful sense of humor and seemed to get along with people really well because of that. He was also a football star throughout high school and graduated high school in 2012. Now, from the time that he graduated up until 2013, he attended South Georgia's Technical College where he was training to become an electrician. Now, after 2013, he decided that he wanted to take a break from school. So he went back home to kind of live with his mom and he was planning on working in his dad's businesses that he had to earn some money so his dad had owned a car wash and also owned a landscaping business so he planned to work there and save up some money so that he can move on to the next stages of life but he did always plan to go back to college and finish his learning as well now as i mentioned before he was an athlete all throughout high school so keeping up with physical fitness and things like that was important to him so he would run pretty much daily and he would run sometimes in his own neighborhood in brunswick and sometimes he would go running in the neighboring areas neighborhood which was Satilla Shores. Now Satilla Shores was much more of a kind of conservative area compared to Brunswick Georgia but nonetheless he enjoyed kind of running through that area going for his daily jogs. Now let me take a step back because a lot of the times when we cover these cases we don't cover everything about our victims or all the persons involved so I don't want to make it seem like Ahmad was this perfect angel all throughout his life he never did anything wrong because a y'all will attack me in the comments a if I don't cover it and b if I don't cover it I think it's unfair to kind of glaze over some of the things that he had going on in his life leading up to this situation. Amar was not a perfect angel but he did things that you know some things that are typical of people who are in college that come from you know a less than background so he was caught in I believe 2017 attempting to shoplift he got caught in the process of shoplifting the other thing that he got in trouble with the police for which he ended up being on probation for was he went to a high school football game probably just to spectate like everyone else but he was carrying a gun on his person at the time and that's obviously against the law to enter any school premises with a weapon so he was on probation for that he never had any charges regarding any type of violence um, any robbery any of those types of things more typical things that would lead up to harsher 
felonious crimes. He also suffered from a mental illness that he was working through that sometimes caused him to hear things or have hallucinations. So he was also dealing with that as well. So I wanted to make sure to cover those things because I am not for y'all coming in the comments saying that I glazed over, that I missed things, that I misrepresented anybody in any way. Now let's talk about the neighborhood that he was actually running through, which was Satilla Shores, right before all of this had taken place. So from December of 2019 to about January 2020, there had been about three either break-ins or thefts in Satilla Shores. Now, the first one took place on December 8th of 2019, where a resident had reported that someone had went into their unlocked car and taken their guns. And there was another theft that was reported by police on December 28th of 2019, which appeared to be of a similar thing and on that car and somebody had gone in and taken a weapon out of the vehicle. Now on January 1st of 2020, Travis McMichael, who was also a resident of Satilla Shores, he had also reported that someone had broken into his car, although it was unlocked, someone had gone into his truck and also taken his weapon out of the truck as well. I call out this name specifically because he is very involved in this case. So let's talk about the McMichaels and who the McMichaels are and why this is important to the case. Now, Travis McMichael was a former mechanic in the Coast Guard, and he also had some law enforcement training in his background as well. He was also the son to Gregory McMichael. Now, who is Gregory McMichael, you say? Gregory McMichael was a once police officer he was also an investigator for the Brunswick District Attorney's Office, and that is where he retired from. He was also a resident of Satilla Shores. Now, he retired from the DA's office as an investigator in 2019, but it is also worth noting that he did work on, or at least help investigate, Ahmaud Arbery's shoplifting case as well. Now on February 11th, so this is after Travis McMichael reported someone had broken into his truck and taken his gun. But on February 11th of 2020, Travis McMichael again calls the police and says that there is a strange black man that is walking around a house Basically, they saw him going through a house that was under construction. Now, when I say under construction, I mean this house has no doors, no windows. It is not boarded up in any way. And Travis proceeds to tell the person on the phone that he looked like he was acting like he had a weapon, but he couldn't tell. I don't know what that means, but okay. He also proceeded to tell the dispatcher that there were some other people, including his father, that were out looking for this suspect. And at least one of the neighbors that was out looking for this guy had a weapon. So dispatch immediately said, police will come out and handle it. So when police got there, they went to the house that was under construction to look to see if that person was still there. The person was not there, nothing had been taken and that was supposed to be the end of that. Now, it's very important to know that this house that is under construction has security cameras both outside of the house and also inside of the house. The homeowners were smart enough to do that because they knew, well, I don't have any windows or doors, so let me make sure that I protect whatever's going on in this house even though I'm not here to kind of watch it. On the camera in this specific incident, on the camera, you could see a person who appeared to be a mod. He had gone into the house, looked around, kind of just curiously looking around inside the house and then left and that was it. Nothing was touched, nothing was taken and he went on his merry way. And it was even said that Ahmad's parents were shown the video as well and they did confirm that it was Ahmad who had gone in the house, looked around and left and continued to jog. He was having a jog that day as well. But on February 23rd of 2020 at around 1 p.m., 108 to be exact, Ahmad is out running in Satilla Shores again, thinking nothing of it, pretty much oblivious that these people have been out trying to find him and have been chasing after him, trying to catch him, and he's just going for a run. So he's come back to Satilla Shores, this time in broad daylight and going for his normal jog. Now again, the cameras capture him as he's running towards this house that's under construction. 
he goes into the house. It's all on camera. Again, he looks around, I guess, to see the progress that the house has made. And then he runs out and continues on his normal job. From what I understand, Georgia law does not say that looking into someone's open home under construction is a felony. It may be a misdemeanor, it may be trespassing, but it's definitely not a felony. And I do have to add, I live in an area where there's a lot of homes being built as well. And while I don't walk into these homes when me and my husband are walking or if we're going for a jog, whatever the case may be, we will stop and kind of take a look and see like, oh, you know, trying to see what's going on with the new home. What does this house have that maybe I don't have? That kind of thing. So it's not like it's some big thing. Yes, he should not be trespassing on people's property, whether it's open under construction or not but it's not a felony. Now, when Ahmad walks out of this home that's under construction and continues on his normal jog, the cameras then pick up a white pickup truck that looks to be following in the same path that Ahmad had gone. And then a few minutes later, you see a couple of police cars also follow in that same direction. And we'll find out why in just a second. But just so you know, this whole interaction, all of this that happened, probably took no more than 30 seconds for a man to lose his life. Now, shortly after Ahmad is on camera, a neighbor calls dispatchers and he does not call 911, he just calls a non-emergency line. And he reports that he saw a man go into a home that's under construction and then run out and kept running. The dispatcher asked him, did he take anything? Were any crimes committed? And the neighbor says, no, nope, doesn't look like he took anything. He just took off running after he walked out. And that was it. So they sent again dispatchers out to kind of check on what was going on in the area. And that was pretty much it from the neighbor's call. Now the neighbor did mention that break-ins in general and Satilla Shores has basically picked up recently and it's been an ongoing type of thing. Now about six minutes later, dispatch receives another call in the same area and there's a man on the phone. He says that he's out in Satilla Shores and that there's a black man running down the street. And this dispatcher asks, where are you in Satilla Shores? And he responds that he doesn't know exactly where he is in the neighborhood but you hear him yelling stop and a lot of profanity in between yelling stop to I guess this person that he was calling about. Now the dispatcher continued to try to get the attention of the caller on the line but the caller would never respond and would never come back on the line. So after several minutes of the dispatcher basically just sitting there listening and hoping that this person would come back the person on the other end of the call just hangs up the phone. This person was Gregory McMichael. When police arrived to the scene in Satilla Shores, they basically only talked to Gregory and McMichael at the scene and they speak to him and just instantly presume that he's just a witness as to whatever happened here today. And we'll get into that whole issue once we talk about the trial. But basically at this point, they're looking at Gregory McMichael as just a witness to what took place. Now, what Gregory had to say was that he was just in his front yard minding his business when this black man ran down the street. And when he saw the black man running down the street, he said that he looked like the same person that had been in the home under construction a few nights back and that he saw this man reach into his waistband as he was running for a weapon. He then says when he saw that, he yelled to his son to get his shotgun, his son being Travis, and he grabbed his 357 Magnum revolver and they were on their way to chase down this suspect. He then says that he knew that this was the man from the string of recent burglaries that had taken place in Satilla Shores. Although later police would say that there was only one actual burglary that had ever been reported in recent times in Satilla Shores. So his statement was completely false. Gregory then goes on to tell police that he and Travis got in the truck, chased this man down the street, who was just jogging, chased this man down the street and tried to cut him off with their truck. When that failed, one of their other neighbors, William Roddy Bryan, he decided that he was going to join the chase also while recording. And he was going to then try to cut off the person running with his truck and then failed. Now, by this time, the person running 
had given up and just started running in the opposite direction. But they continued to chase him and harass him. Gregory then says that they yell to this person on the street, stop, we just want to talk to you. But Gregory is standing on the back of the pickup truck, as we'll later find out. He didn't mention that when he was talking to police. He's standing on the back of his son's truck with his 357 Magnum revolver in hand. And his son stops the truck and hops out with his shotgun in hand. So what was that about? I just want to talk to you. But Gregory then says that as soon as his son got out of this truck innocently with his shotgun, the person that they were chasing violently attacked his son and tried to grab at the gun that his son was holding. And in self-defense, his son shot the man two times. And that was it. After being shot, the man laid there in the middle of the street and bled out. That man was Ahmaud Arbery. Now I mentioned that William Roddy Bryan, who joined the chase as the third person voluntarily, he also recorded the entire chase. So there is video that you can watch, censored or uncensored. Let's talk through what that video actually showed versus what Gregory McMichael told police when they arrived on the scene. Now, I do wanna point out that an attorney on behalf of William Bryant actually shared this video with a radio station's website which then was put onto YouTube and it went viral. This was uploaded on May 5th of 2020, months after this actually happened. So no one was aware of what actually had happened prior to this. So what the video shows, which is about 30 seconds or so long, the video shows the McMichaels and Brian both following Ahmad as he's running or jogging through the street. Now, Ahmad is on the left side of the street. The trucks are on the right side of the street. Now, after the trucks stop, you can clearly see that Gregory McMichael is standing on the bed of the truck, the back of the pickup truck, and you can see Travis with his shotgun. Now, when Travis gets out with his shotgun, there's some shouting that goes on. And what you then see is you see Ahmad kind of circle the truck away from Travis and goes around the passenger side and then he comes across the front of the truck and once he comes across the front of the truck and he's kind of closer to Travis, the view in the video is blocked for a second so you can't really see what's going on, but it seems like there's some shouting and there's some fighting, tussling back and forth, and then you can hear shots ring out. So one shot rings out and then both kind of go off into the left out of view of the camera. And then you hear two more shots ring out. Now, Gregory said that his son only shot twice. On the video, there were three shots. And we'll also learn during the autopsy, there were three shots. Now, when Ahmad is shot the last time, he looks like he's trying to kind of move forward and run, but then he stumbles and then he falls face first into the street. And from there, he basically bled out and you see Travis walk away. And this is when it was said that you hear Travis saying and then at that point you see Gregory move towards Travis and Ahmad with his gun out. Ahmad was shot three times and was not armed with anything. Now one other big piece of this case that we really need to talk about is this district attorney dance that went on with this case. It was just a hot mess. Hot mess. Now the case originally started off with the Brunswick district attorney Jackie Johnson and she had to recuse herself because Gregory McMichael worked for her prior to retiring so she had to recuse herself from this specific case. Investigators also found out that police had actually come to Jackie Johnson saying hey we're ready to file charges on the men that shot Ahmaud Arbery. There is sufficient evidence to proceed with charges. We're ready to go and she told them do not arrest those men. Now, of course, she tried to deny treating them any type of way or instructing the police not to file charges, but there was proof that she did. When Jackie Johnson recused herself, the case was then transferred to Waycross's district attorney, which is south of Brunswick, and it was given to George Barnhill. Now, George Barnhill was a whole other mess. The day after this whole incident took place, 
George Barnhill offered his initial opinion of saying that the shooting of Ahmaud Arbery was justified as self-defense and that the autopsy somehow supported that. He also went on to say that the McMichaels had the right to chase a burglary suspect with solid probable firsthand cause that he thought that they had. He also went so far to say that Ahmad was the one that initiated the confrontation and that Travis was 100% within his right to use deadly force once Ahmad grabbed his gun. He then went on to cite the citizen's arrest law, which stated that either a crime must be committed within the citizen's immediate knowledge or there has to be reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion of a felony being committed. And he said that the felony that Ahmad committed was burglarizing that home that was under construction. He also kept this ball rolling on the attack of Ahmad Aubrey by saying that his mental health illness, his prior convictions, all of this really does kind of lay out the reasoning why he would be so aggressive and why he would be aggressive enough to attack an armed man. To me, it just seems like maybe he was fighting for his life after he tried to run quite a few times and couldn't get away. And then he put the icing on the cake when he tried to bring Ahmad's family into this by saying, oh, this family is also no stranger to having criminal issues and being arrested, things of that nature. He kind of just wanted to put that last cherry on top of his statement. He said all of this on April 2nd in a memorandum. Now this memorandum was for him to also recuse himself because his son worked with Gregory McMichael as well. And also the initial opinion that he gave on the justification of the shooting in this case, he offered that on February 24th, the day after it actually happened. And he wasn't asked to participate or oversee this case until the 27th. So who are you giving this initial opinion to? He also said things like there was video evidence of Ahmad burglarizing the home when the actual owner in fact said, I have all the video and nothing was ever taken. The home was wide open. There were no doors or windows. It was just a structure at that point. Nothing was ever taken. I'm not missing anything. Nobody stole anything. But nonetheless, he was forced to recuse himself actually because Ahmad's mother asked that he be recused. He wasn't gonna recuse himself, but he was forced to recuse himself and this case was then passed on to another neighboring district attorney. This time it was passed on to the Atlantic district attorney, which was north of Brunswick this time. And his name was Tom Durden. Now, as soon as that video went viral and not any time before that, as soon as the video went viral, Durden came out and said, we're going to get this in front of a grand jury as soon as humanly possible. At this point, it's been over two months since this actually happened. Now, one other good thing that Durden did was he also allowed the GBI to help investigate this case. Now on May 7th of 2020, it took the GBI 36 hours, not two months, 36 hours to find enough evidence to arrest the McMichaels. They both were arrested for felony murder and were denied bond. Now eventually Tom Durden decided that the case was just too much for him in his little office. And he asked that the case be transferred to a bigger DA's office that had more manpower to be able to staff and handle this case. So now this case is now being passed on to the fourth DA. So on May 11th of 2020, the case is passed on to the Cobb County DA, Joyette Holmes. Now, this is a DA that the Arbery family is finally happy about because it's in a district where the makeup of the population heavily accounts for not just white people, but black people and other ethnicities and races of people as well. Now, the GBI continues to complete their investigation and on May 21st, William Bryan is also arrested for felony murder and false imprisonment. So I remember as I was following this case, as everything kind of went viral and hit the news and 
At first, Brian was kind of seen as like, oh, this good Samaritan that was standing by, although a lot of people were questioning why was he just standing by and recording when all of this was happening. But it was more so he was just kind of a bystander that happened to be there and was recording everything to make sure that it was on record. But eventually the GBI found that he was not just a bystander. He had joined in on the chase. He had tried to use his truck, just like the McMichaels. He had tried to use his truck to cut off Ahmad as he was trying to run away from them about five separate times. And there was physical evidence on his truck to support that. They found a handprint that belonged to Ahmad Arbery on this man's truck. Along with the handprint, there was cotton fibers from the clothes that Ahmad was wearing. And right near those cotton fibers was a dent. So he had actually hit Ahmad with his truck trying to block him in. Now the preliminary hearing was held on June 4th of 2020 and the lead GBI investigator testified. And basically what he said was that these men chased him down, him being a mod, as if they were hunting him. And then they basically executed this man. He also said that none of these men tried to call the police before they began to pursue Ahmad Arbery as he was jogging through the neighborhood. Not one of them called the police beforehand. The first call was received mid chase. The investigator also stated that he did not believe that this was a case of self-defense on the part of Travis McMichael. He felt this was a case of self-defense on the part of Ahmad Arbery. And he said it was evident that he had tried to run away a number of times as these people continue to use their vehicles to try to block his path and he would turn and try to run in another direction and it failed. So then at that point it became, do I just stay here and let them shoot me? Or do I fight for my life for Ahmad Arbery? It was also confirmed that Travis McMichael had used those racial slurs that I mentioned before on the scene. And it was also shown that he had used those same slurs before in his social media posts and his text messages. It was also said that he liked to ride around, you know, typically with a, a Confederate flag on his truck, you know, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of implications here when you find all of these different things. Is it really driven by race? Was this attack racially driven? But on June 24th, all three, Gregory McMichael, Travis McMichael and William Bryan were indicted on these charges. None of them got bond. Now let's talk about the trial. So in terms of the jury makeup, there was one black man, three white men, and 12 white women. That's counting the, al the alternates for the jurors as well. Now it was said that the defense struck 11 out of 12 black people from being a part of the jury whatsoever. But first the prosecution presented its case. So the prosecution brought on a police officer, a GCPD police officer, and he basically testified that George McMichael knew full well of what was going on and what was not going on. Officer Robert Rash, was a friend of the person who was having that house built that was under construction at the time. He was also friendly with Gregory McMichael and he said that he had talked to Gregory McMichael about what was going on and that the officer's friend that was having the house built was concerned about what he was seeing on the camera. Nothing was ever really taken, but he just didn't feel comfortable with anyone trespassing on his property. When the police officer brought this up to Gregory McMichael, he offered his cell phone number to be passed along to the homeowner so that they could help one another. And the police officer thought this would be a great idea because whenever they caught whoever it was, if they were stealing something, then Gregory McMichael would be a wonderful expert witness to have given his background. The officer did tell Gregory McMichael that nothing was taken, the guy was just trespassing, and that he had been looking for Ahmad just to tell him, hey, stop trespassing on this property, the owner is aware, please stop. That's all the officer was gonna do if he caught up with Ahmad. However, I believe this was a grave mistake by the police officer, but he showed the surveillance footage about 12 days before this incident took place 
to Gregory McMichael. So Gregory saw Ahmad's face on this surveillance video. The officer also mentioned to Gregory that there had been some thefts of people going into unlocked cars and taking guns and that Ahmad had nothing to do with it. He said he distinctly told him that this guy had nothing to do with it. They know who did these other crimes, but just that it had been happening in Satilla Shores. There were other officers that testified for the prosecution that said Gregory McMichael, when being interviewed, told them that if he had the shot that he could take, he would have shot Ahmad himself. Even though he would follow that statement up with saying, I'm not sure that he committed any crime at all. So if you have a man standing on the back of a pickup truck with another pickup truck following behind them, the driver has a shotgun in hand. You're blocking this man in and he cannot get away. He's tried to run away from confrontation. What do you expect this man to do? They also had officers that interviewed William Bryan testify that Bryan told them that he had no clue what Ahmad had done in the first place to be chased, but he joined the chase anyway, and that he tried to use his truck to block him in at least five times. The homeowner also went on to say in his deposition that he never authorized, asked anyone to confront anyone on his behalf of his property that was being built or to police his property in any way either. There was no deputizing of anyone in the neighborhood to watch out for his property. The neighbor that had originally called the non-emergency police line said he called that line because there was not an emergency. He saw Ahmad go into the property, he came right back out, he didn't have anything in his hand. He didn't take anything. So there was no emergency. He just wanted to make someone aware that somebody's going into this open property. Prosecutors also presented social media posts that Travis had made and commented on about vigilante action being taken in their neighborhoods because of the recent rash of break-ins and thefts that they had. And he felt like, you know, people committing local crimes and thieves should be dealt with because they shouldn't be able to just go to jail. They should be dealt with. And he didn't care about going to jail behind that. Now the defense put on a parade of neighbors to kind of just talk to the point that everyone in Satilla Shores was on edge because of all of these recent break-ins and these thefts that were happening. And then to see someone late at night going in and out of a property that was under construction really just had everyone up in arms and in fear of their neighborhood, which in some ways I can understand, but in other ways it's always an unlocked vehicle that was being broken into. So why not just lock your doors and let police do their jobs? The defense also had Travis testify and he said that 12 days before this event actually took place, he saw Ahmad creeping around the house that was under construction and went to go confront him. He said when he went to go confront him, he reached again in his waistband as if he had a weapon. So Travis left and then called the police because he quote, was not going to confront someone who was armed. He then proceeds to testify that on the day that Ahmad was actually shot and killed, he said he didn't see Ahmad go into the property on this day. He said his dad just ran into the house, extremely frantic, saying, grab your shotgun. We're about to go chase this man down. So he also mentioned that as they were chasing him down, he saw Brian join the chase and try to cut Ahmad off a number of times. And it looked like Ahmad was trying to open the door of Brian's truck to stop him from doing whatever it was he was doing. And he also said that he did not ask Brian to join in in any way. He just seemed to join on his own. He proceeds to then say that he told his father to call the police, but his father Gregory said that he did not have a phone. How? How did you not have a phone when there is record of you calling while this chase is happening? It sounds like you wanted trouble. He then says, as he is chasing Ahmad, he is trying to calmly ask him questions while cutting him off as he's trying to run away. And I feel like no one's going to answer you. He said that Ahmad did not answer. I wouldn't answer you either. If I'm just on a casual jog, minding my business, and I see two pickup trucks chasing me and trying to cut me off, and I'm trying to get out of the way, so no one is going to answer you at all. Another thing that I thought about as I was researching this is, 
he's running. I'm sure he's not layered with clothing. You can visibly see if he took anything. If this man has nothing, not even a phone, which he did not have on his person, he has nothing. Why are you still chasing him? Why are you still bothering this man? But either way, Travis said that he continued to follow Ahmad so that he could keep an eye on the suspect for police. He also stated very clearly that when Ahmad approached him, he had no weapons that he could see. Ahmad made no threats to him whatsoever. So how is this self-defense? He said that he shot the gun once he grabbed the gun to get Ahmad to stop grabbing at the gun. Thankfully, the jury did not buy that, no matter the makeup, because on November 24th of 2021, yes, we can say that now, it was last year, after 12 hours of deliberating over a couple of days, everybody involved was found guilty. Now, let me read these crimes to you verbatim of what they were convicted of. So Travis McMichael was found guilty of malice murder, four counts of felony murder, two counts of aggravated assault with a firearm and with his vehicle, false imprisonment, and a criminal attempt to commit a felony, which was false imprisonment. Gregory McMichael was found guilty of four counts of felony murder, two counts of aggravated assault, again with a firearm and his truck, false imprisonment, and criminal attempt to commit a felony as well. He was found not guilty of malice murder because he didn't pull the trigger. William Bryan was found guilty of three counts of felony murder, one count of aggravated assault with his truck, false imprisonment, and the criminal attempt to commit a felony, which was the false imprisonment, and he was also found not guilty of malice murder as well. Now, with all of those charges, there is a mandatory life sentence that all three of them will have, which is them serving at least 30 years in prison. So the sentencing phase is actually going to take place later this week on January 7th. What the judge will basically be deciding is whether or not to give them life with parole or life without the possibility of parole. The malice murder that Travis McMichael was convicted of as well carries a potential sentence of the death penalty should they choose to give him that. So all of that will be decided in just a few days. Now, a lot of things have been happening after the case has come to kind of a close minus the sentencing hearing and of course all of the appeals that will definitely take place because everybody appeals everything. But they are also all facing federal charges. So they were convicted by the state on all of those charges that I mentioned and they are still going to be facing federal charges for things like hate crimes and kidnapping that their current convictions hold no bearings on. Now, a quote from federal prosecutors stated that the defendants use force and threats of force to intimidate and interfere with Arbery's right to use a public street because of his race, AKA running while black. Now also the ex DA for Brunswick, which was Jackie Johnson. She was recently indicted on charges for violating the oath of a public officer by showing affection and favoritism to Gregory McMichael during this case. She also failed to report that she had gone to George Barnhill for recommendations or advice on this case. Also for directing police not to arrest Travis and Gregory McMichael when they had sufficient evidence to be arrested in this case. And it also needs to be noted that she lost her bid for re-election in 2020. Now there have also been some issues and allegations made on the GCPD as well. There is allegations of misconduct, tampering with evidence, interfering in investigations, and also retaliating on officers who want to tell the truth. So there's a lot of moving parts still going through the justice system here as well. Now there are two good things that also came out of this case as well. The first thing was that this case really was the catalyst to Georgia's first hate crime law. Every hate crime law that Georgia has tried to enact or put into place has been turned down by Georgia's Supreme Court once it got there. But for the first time in June of 2020, Georgia's hate crime law was put into place. 
So the law requires now that there be a higher sentence given to defendants that quote, are convicted of targeting a victim due to actual or perceived race, color, religion, national origin, sex, sexual orientation, gender, mental disability, or physical disability. Kudos to the legislation in Georgia for at least getting that into place. And the other great thing that came from this case was in February 16 of 2021, the citizen's arrest law had been changed. Now this law was around since the Civil War, etc. But that was finally changed because of this case. So now the new law for a citizen's arrest, it only pertains to certain private persons such as licensed private detectives, security guards, shopkeepers, and restaurant employees to conduct an arrest under special specific circumstances. So no more just anybody who felt like they should go arrest somebody with a citizen's arrest can do it because they felt like it or because they thought something happened. So that is the case thus far in the killing of Ahmad Arbery, who was just a young black man that was running through a nice neighborhood, minding his business, and was chased down like an animal and killed in the street. I still feel for this family. I still feel for all of the loved ones that were involved in this case and for other people who have met similar situations and similar fates because they were a certain skin color and they didn't fit in the neighborhood or they didn't fit into the box of what people around them thought that they should be. This is a case that really got to me and I followed it and I wanted to make sure to see it all the way through to the end before I presented it to you guys to be able to give you the most information possible, the most accurate information possible. And now that we're at the point of sentencing, we have a verdict, which is something that I'm hoping offers some type of just a little bit of closure to the family and the loved ones of Ahmad and to help to deter this from happening again with things like the changes to the citizen's arrest law, the hate crime law being added in the state of Georgia. I'm really hoping that the changes continue to happen because of this case and cases like these. And I'm hoping that we get to see more positive outcomes for cases like these. A lot of the times we've seen people not be held accountable for their actions when it's something like this. In this case, running while black and being killed because you were running while black in a white neighborhood. You don't see a lot of people actually face the repercussions for the actions that they took. So to see it actually happen in a place like Georgia, just a little bit promising. I wanna hear what you guys thought about this case. I wanna hear y'all engage in these comments down below. This is a fresh case. I will update y'all on the sentencing, whether it be a quick post or a few minutes in another video. I will make sure to update you guys on the sentencing. I still plan on doing a formal update on the Julius Jones case and where he is at this point, but I wanna hear what you guys think about this one. Let me know in the comments down below if you think that this was the right outcome for this case, if you feel a different type of way about this case. There are a million sources out there, so I try to keep it you know, straight down the middle in terms of what actually happened, what was actually discussed in the case. The case was actually very open, all the documents you can see these things so it's not that I'm one side or another side in this case it's all there it's all there and documented so love to hear you guys engage about this case I really want to hear what you guys think I love having these types of conversations about cases that really can shape the way that our country moves forward I will bring you more of these cases I also do still plan on doing some true crime and makeup to kind of break up these more heavy bigger cases as well so be on the lookout for that as well but it's been fun it's been real and until next time love you guys bye